The purpose of this video is to give you an overview of the different ways of achieving a three-dimensional illusion on a two-dimensional surface. I think to get the most out of this, I would try to think of, and maybe even draw them out, as many ways as you can think of. Uh, depending on how you group them, you should be able to come up with five or six. So go ahead and pause now and do that. If I were in a classroom with you, I'd probably ask people to shout out different ways and then draw them on the whiteboard. What I'll do in this video is use Photoshop and just draw with my mouse pad on here. So they won't be great drawings, but they'll be about the same as they would be on a whiteboard or a dry erase board. Um, and then I'll also show you Google images to get some of the ideas across. But what I want to make clear is that any Thing that you see me doing in Photoshop has absolutely nothing to do with any project that you might be assigned. I'll talk about the, the technology that you need to do the associated project separately. Okay, so I'll go through the different ways of achieving the, the three-dimensional illusion. And I'll try to do them in a way that's maybe the, the simplest to the most complex. So first we have scale change. And really what scale change means is we're trying to trick the person into thinking that the things in the foreground um, that look bigger are closer to us and the things that are smaller are in the background so if you draw a rectangle and then you draw another rectangle that is smaller the idea is that you're trying to give the illusion that this one's closer and this one's further apart. So that's really all that's meant by scale change. But I'm going to add to this, make this a little more convincing. But first we're going to knock out another technique. And that is overlapping. So with overlapping, if I have a rectangle, and then I have another rectangle, that overlaps it, we start to get the idea that this one might just be in front of this one. But think for a second how we could make that even more convincing that let's say that this one here is in front. So one way to do that would just be to simply eliminate that line now it looks less like a suggestion that that one is in front and more like mm, there's pretty no pretty much no question that this one is in front show you the third technique i want to go back to this example and see if you can think of how we could just redraw this with a slight change to make it more convincing that this one is further away without overlapping or anything we'll keep them right in the same spot but what could we do different so i'll start to draw this out and you start to think of what we could do to the second rectangle to give more of an idea that it's in the back so if you said to make the line weight thinner I would say that was a good idea and so what we call that is line weight variation now item number four here actually has a bunch of subcategories to it let's start out simple and uh, I'll show you the more complex although keep in mind you can take a full semester long class that deals with perspective drawing Let me just show you like very generically what we often mean when we talk about perspective is just kind of giving us the idea that things are getting like this could be a box and uh, it's it, when we see it in perspective the front edge of it is bigger the back edge gets smaller kind of goes hand in hand with scale change and we can just kind of intuitively draw these things or we can use 
some formulaic ways to come up with them. But that's, in a nutshell, what we mean by perspective. If we want to go over perspective theory quickly, in a nutshell, we start with one-point perspective. So for one-point perspective, you start out with a point. And the thing about one-point perspective is it has this kind of odd, highly improbable premise to it that everything that faces us in the scene faces us straight on. So if there is a cube in front of us, that cube is not twisted to the side at all. It's facing us straight on. So there's our cube facing us straight on and then it recedes back. Think of like a train track standing on the train track. Everything recedes back from this face to the one point. What you do is you place your ruler at this corner and draw a line to the vanishing point. And then these become just a, a guide. And then we switch back to, I'll just switch back to the typical color that I was using here. And then you would go in and you would cover this. And when you get to where the back of your box or your rectangle is, you just come straight across parallel to this face. And that would be perspective of this box. Anything else in the scene is going to face us straight on and recede to that same exact point. And when things give you the option to drag out three guides, like this one there is no option because we can't at all start to see the sides, right? Unless it was hollow uh, or, or see-through like glass, then we would have you know, that internal thing, but assuming that it's not see-through, you would not see any of that. But these, since they're off to the side, would give you the opportunity for more guidelines. The ends of our objects are always drawn parallel to the other side, so this mark would be straight up and down like that one. This one would come across here parallel with this mark. This one would come down parallel with this mark. Then when we continue that on, turn off the guides, that's what you end up with. If you Google one point perspective and go to images, you'll see some very nice drawings here, but notice that everything that's in the picture plane that we can see all of it is straight on facing us, these building faces here and, and so on. And then to make things a little more complex, we move on to two-point perspective. Now keep in mind, this is a crash course in these things, and if you're getting a project that is in a big beginning graphic design class, all I'll be asking you to do is create a sense of depth. How you do it is not as important as the fact that you are doing it and whether you understand perspective or not really doesn't matter. In fact, let me just give you a little example on that. Let's say that you drew some shapes like this, and then you drew something in here like this. That doesn't go along with the, the one-point perspective, and you can see it's a little awkward. This comes up. Can anyone looking at your drawing say that you're wrong? No. Maybe this uh, is a solid, nice, clean face, but then this is kind of triangular-ish, and then the top happens to bend up. Could be like a, a bag that you put on the back of a lawnmower or, you know, something like that. So don't worry about that you get all of this, like, down right now. It's just an overview so that you're aware of these things and you can decide to study them more at, as you choose. Two-point perspective you generally draw out a horizon line and then pick two points. And I'll use an X here just to make them stick out a little bit better. And then the big difference here is that you get to turn things so that it's not everything is just facing us. So let's start with a rectangle here right at the beginning. Now what you do is you make your guides go from the top to this perspective point and the bottom, same thing, and go this way. There's the start of your guides, and if you want your rectangle or your building, however you want to look at it, 
to end there and there, then you do exactly that. Now keep in mind, these are all parallel to each other. And then the bottom, I'll just call it a building, um, is going to go along the guides. And the top is going to go along with the guides. Now you have to go back and you have to draw some guides from here to here and from here to here. And then once you've done that, you can complete the top of your building. And if we turn the guides off, you can see a little bit more complex shape. If you go above the horizon line, then it's like something floating in outer space or, you know, a, a box aircraft. Um, and so you'll be able to see the bottom of it instead of the top, as you see here. And you should note that the closer you get, like over to the left or to the right to your um, perspective points, the more of a distortion you can end up with. And if you go like really down far and up high, you'll get more distortion. But that's kind of the, the nutshell of two point. And if we go out to Google Images, you can see some beautiful examples here of what you can create with two point perspective. And this one's kind of nice to look at because it show you can see the horizon line and the light drawings of the uh, guides going all the way out to the points. You come to three point perspective, which is a little rarer. It's more of an exaggeration perspective, like especially here, you can see that building really looks, um, you know, like exaggerated, like the bottom is really big, the top is really small. And um, where you see it most often, in fact, it's, it's kind of sometimes referred to as comic book perspective because if you have a superhero flying in the sky you want to get the idea of how high up it is so you add a third point to your perspective and instead of the edges of this building this wall being parallel to this one now it follows down to that third point as we get into some of these later ones here i'm going to put them in blue and that's just to remind you that if you're doing the um, 3D on 2D project, you cannot use these um, in it. And I'm going to save this one a little bit later, and I'm going to go to light and shadow. Uh, you can kind of use this one, but not literally. When light and shadow is added to an object that's already in perspective, it, it really kind of drives the point home. The light is shining from about here, I guess. This is, you know, maybe this way, this is a little bit, uh, well, this is the, the brightest. This is a little bit less dark. This is starting to get into the shadow. And then you have shadows that are being cast. In the project associated with this lesson, the only way you could really do this would be to use, like, say, hatching lines going across here to make it look more gray. But remember, in the project, everything is either white or black there's no grays and then to get this side darker you could put hatches this way and then cross hatch going this way so I put that little reminder on there and then I'm gonna fill in this blank and that brings us to atmospheric perspective which is is would be very difficult to mimic in this project two major components of atmospheric per, uh, perspective is that you get less contrast as things get further away. The other thing that happens is the further things get away from us, the cooler they turn in color. So if you've had that experience where you're driving up on a mountain and from a distance it looked purple or blue, but then when you got close it looked green, just like all the other vegetation around you, that's atmospheric perspective. So there you go. There is an overview of how to achieve a sense of three dimensions on a flat two-dimensional piece of paper or computer screen.